So I want to begin with a, I want to begin with a couple of acknowledgements, actually, if I may. Um, and then I have a couple of caveats, and then finally I'll get going. Um, but I just, I just wanted to uh, remember my dear friend Bob McDonald, who he and I talked three or four years ago about giving this talk, and the book took so much longer to come out that um, we never finished that conversation. Um, <clears throat> and I also want to acknowledge um, uh, Richard Mackey. Um, so Richard arranged, oh, it's a decade ago, I think, Richard, arranged for me to meet with Marnie Duff, Wilson's daughter, and we met at the oyster catcher on the deck in the sun on Salt Spring Island. And that's how this got all, all got started. So Richard, you're responsible. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, okay, a couple of things. Um, my talk tonight, I fear, is not exactly as advertised. That is, this is the title I wanted to use for the talk, which is not the one that appeared on the advertising, which was, I think, Understanding Indigenous Peoples. I hope you'll see by the end of this talk that what I have to say is as much about understanding uh, newcomer society as it is about understanding uh, indigenous societies. And then the other thing is, uh, the, other ca the other thing I want to say is a warning. Um, my first image, what do they say on Knowledge Network? Uh, this this uh, contains adult material and may not be suitable for all viewers. So when I throw up my first image, um, look away if it's uh, upsetting to you. <coughs> John, you mentioned contact and conflict, so permit me a moment of nostalgia. 50 years ago, and I really was a, a newcomer then, uh, I was doing the research that led to contact and conflict. Um, and in that book, I thought I was pretty clear about the impact of settler colonization on First Nations people in British Columbia. Um, and that impact through the combined um, activities of gold miners, settlers, missionaries, and government officials, and their ideas and actions, and the impact that all of that had on First Nations people. Now, in spite of um, John's uh, very positive remarks about contact and conflict, it was not totally well accepted in all quarters in British Columbia. Uh, so that book earned me, and that's the adult contact, that book earned me that headline in the Vancouver Sun. It was the first review I got of Contact and Conflict, and for a young scholar, it wasn't all that pleasant, but I've got to say, ah, I'm kind of proud of it now. <laughs> um, another another uh, senior historian on the BC Book Prize um, uh, panel called Contact and Conflict the slanted view of the outsider. So British Columbia 50 years ago wasn't really ready for this kind of conversation about the impact of colonization. Now we've come around to a greater understanding of the impact of colonization. Indeed, I think now it's the dominant narrative, often to the exclusion of all else. Historians, I think, should closely examine do uh, dominant narratives, particularly when they become mandated by governments and the media. And I'm very sorry, Alan Morley, but I, so I have resisted, contrary to his advice, um, the notion of mellowing with age, as he thought I might. Um, <clears throat> so as I did 50 years ago, I'm going to suggest tonight that there is a countercurrent of British Columbia history. Now, I don't want for one moment to diminish the impact of colonization in British Columbia the taking of the land, the diminishing of the population to a tiny fraction of what it was at contact, and the brutal yet unsuccessful effort to s dismantle the cultures of the people of British Columbia. It's a terrible history, no question. And it's made worse, I think, by the fact that there were some individuals during that history who tried to stem the colonial tide and make this a better place for First Nations people, Yet they, like indigenous people, were not heard by most of the newcomers at the time. Some such individuals, I, one, I would argue, um, James Douglas, who had a vision of a multicultural society that was drowned in the settler tide. Gilbert Mal Malcolm Sproat, who tried to see something like fair play for First Nations people over the land, 
and was kicked out of his role as a reserve commissioner as a result. Or James Tate, who Wendy Wickwire has written about so compellingly. And my subject tonight, Wilson Duff. Wilson spent his life seeking to understand First Nations people and cultures and communicating that understanding to a largely uncomprehending uh, population of newcomers. This is Roy Henry Vickers' uh, absolutely fabulous image called Eagle Full Circle, which um, uh, Roy um, painted in memory of Wilson Duff. Um, <clears throat> And both Roy and Wilson certainly believe that life is a circle and probably there's not just one circle. Wilson's is a very Vancouver story in many ways, though I'm not going to dwell on this. He grew up in a, in a, a very uh, working class house in, in a working class neighborhood in, on Lanark Street in South Vancouver. That house, the smaller house, was built by his father in large part by his own hands. And his life ended at a much more substantial house out near UBC on Ptolemy Street. <coughs> Before he became an anthropologist, there were many interesting parts of his, his, his young life. Um, as a navigator, uh, Wilson is on the right-hand side of that, uh, that image. Um, as a navigator on a Liberator bomber, uh, bombing uh, the Malay Peninsula out of India. Um, Wilson, I, those, those bombing crews just amaze me. Those guys were just kids. We wouldn't let our kids drive a car at the age they were flying those bombers and uh, go, going back and forth successfully. <clears throat> Came back from the war, graduated from UBC. Here's a, here's a picture of him on graduation day with the Haida student, Percy Gladstone who is Bill Reed's uncle, I believe. He learned archaeology from Charles Borden, probably the senior archaeologist, well, no, undoubtedly the senior archaeologist of the day. Um, and then in 1950, at the age of 25 only, um, he was appointed provincial anthropologist at the Provincial Museum in Victoria. And it's his years as provincial anthropologist that I mostly want to talk about. And he began a career devoted to understanding Indian cultures and communicating that understanding to often uninterested or just deaf newcomers. He was the first qualified anthropologist to work at the museum, yet actually his anthropological training was limited, which perhaps accounts for his independence of thought. Maybe sometimes less ed education in a discipline is not such a bad thing. Don't know how far I'd want to push that, but <laughs> it, it worked for Wilson. He had only done four courses in anthropology in his BA under Harry Hawthorne, who, who was the person who founded the anthropology department at UBC, and a year of graduate course, coursework under Erna Gunther at the University of Washington. He was thrown after that into the whole range of work as provincial anthropologist, in addition to working on his MA thesis, which was to be an ethnography of the upper Stalo. Now let's remember what it was like for First Nations people in British Columbia, even in 1950. They were still suffering from the traumatic effects of a century of settler colonization. Those effects were both endemic across the province and intensely local. They had voted for the first time in 1949, and one of their number, Frank Calder, had been elected to the provincial legislature in, in Victoria, but registered Indians still had to wait another 10 years to vote federally. The province of British Columbia dismissed their ownership of the land as irrelevant. Um, there were still huge constraints on economic and social development because the, f the reserves were so tiny. Starting in the 1860s, the reserves that had been laid out originally were gradually whittled away by various governments, both federal and provincial. Living conditions and health care were appalling in many communities. In 1950, it was still illegal to organize or raise money to protest against the historical misappropriation of Aboriginal land. It was still illegal to hold a potlatch and children, like many of their parents, were still being sent to residential school, still with devastating results. In 90, just to go to the local, in 1946, a First, Nation man, uh, First Nations man, a decorated vet veteran of the Second World War, was several times sent to Ocala prison 
for trying to eat in a Vanderhoof cafe that refused to serve First Nations people. In short, settler society in 1950 it had a dreadful record of treatment of its First Nations people. It was in that colonial context that Wilson sought to bring First Nations voices and a First Nations presence into the provincial museum. He believed that museums were for teaching and learning, like universities. But museums were also places where the voices of other cultures could speak to us, where we could listen to those voices and think about our own culture. So I want to look at two initiatives that he took uh, in particular at the Provincial Museum. Um, I want to look at the carving program at Thunderbird Park and secondly look at uh, Wilson's reclamation of totem poles, particularly on Haida Gwaii. First of all, Thunderbird Park. So located a block away from the then museum building, which is of course not the existing museum building, it was then in the legislative building, uh, on the corner of Douglas and Belleville Street, Thunderbird Park had been established many years before 1950, but not much thought had gone into it. Uh, the the, the, the was, and even worse, there was no consultation, certainly with any anthropologist, let alone any member of the cultures from whence the totem poles and the house fronts that were there came. The poles were deteriorating and the house fronts were not authentic. And so it needed work and it needed a lot of work and a lot of thought. And Wilson needed an experienced carver to work with him on the project. And he found that person in Mungo Martin, the Kwakwakwiwak Kwakutl artist and elder. That's the um, well-known image of Mungo Martin. <coughs> so Mungo Martin had been born in Prince Rupert, Fort Rupert, sorry, probably around 1880. He had learned to carve from his stepfather, uh, Charlie James, and then in 1947 he came to UBC to work on Totem Park with Audrey and Harry Hawthorne uh, in the anthropology department there. But in 1952 the funding for the UBC project ran out, and so Wilson stepped in and with funding support from the provincial government, brought Mungo to work at Thunderburn Park. Wilson arranged for his wife, Abea, and other family members to live in a house on Michigan Street uh, near the park at government expense. So Wilson and Mungo Martin were two different ages, uh, two different generations, two different cultures, but they developed a very close friendship. So there's Wilson Duff in his office um, in the Provincial Museum and Mungo Martin, I guess, in his office uh, carving out at uh, the carving shed in Totem Park. Uh, they, um, they visited each other's houses, they drank beer and danced with each other's partners on social occasions. Wilson joined the wild parties at the Carver's house on payday. And here they are, I call this image, three men in a boat. Wilson in the front, Mungo in the middle, and uh, Henry Hunt, who was one, also one of the Carver's uh, steering. <clears throat> Thunderbird Park rapidly became, oh, um, let me, uh, this is actually a, a mask that uh, Wilson carved under the guidance of uh, Mungo Martin. <clears throat> and it's a very generic image. Wilson didn't want to carve anything that represented a crest owned by a First Nations uh, group or individual. And when Mungo taught Wilson to carve, there was no doubt about who was the student and who was the master. After years of working together, Wilson described Mungo Martin as, quote, the carver of the century. But Thunderbird Park quickly became the largest single project at the museum. They set up a carving shed and Mungo made both replicas of some old totem poles in the park and also some originals. It was both a museum display and a tourist attraction, as the museum is now. Um, the Times claimed, the, the Victoria Times, the newspaper, claimed that Mungo Martin was the most photographed man in Victoria at the time. But more important, in the long run, Mungo Martin and Wilson kept a traditional art form going. There's been a lot of semantic dancing by scholars around what was the state of First Nations art in the 1950s. Was it dead? Was it dying? Did it need to be resuscitated or revived? Whatever you, whatever you say about it, the state of First Nations art was not alive and well, and Wilson and Mungo kept it alive by a slender thread. 
that comment by Gloria Cranmer Webster. Mungo and Wilson worked together in many ways to create a record of Kwakwakiwa culture. They spent time talking about the past and present way of Kwakutl life. Mungo told stories and sang songs. Uh, he carved and painted masks and other smaller items. Abea Martin, Mungo's uh, wife, wove baskets and chilcat blankets, and they were added to the collection. So that partnership between Wilson and the Martins contributed to the Provincial Museum in a whole variety of ways. Beside, but besides the totem poles, probably the most spectacular was the house that Mungo built and the potlatch that announced its opening. <clears throat> the house was built over long hours through the summer of 1953 according to a traditional pattern. There were interior house posts at the back um, that were carved replicas of Kwakwakiwa house posts and the spectacular painted front represented a supernatural sea monster shaped like a sculpin. Mungo also carved a large heraldic totem pole to stand in front of the house representing all of the Kwakutl groups. It was very much Mungo Martin's house. As Wilson wrote, this is a new house and it's more than just an authentic Kwakutl house, it is Mungo Martin's house. It bears on its house posts hereditary crests of his family. Mungo named the house Wawad Itla, meaning he orders them to come inside. And many were indeed ordered to come inside when the house was opened with a potlatch in 1953. Here's the scene inside the house um, during um, three days of celebration of the opening of the house. Um, Wilson and Mungo are in the center row of the center of the center row of the picture with. Uh, uh, Mungo's son David between them. Wilson was adamant that this potlatch to open the house was to be done the way Mungo Martin wanted it, according to the knowledge of Kwakutl traditions. After several rehearsals, the ceremonies took place over three days in mid-December. The first day was for Indian guests only, not a show, as Wilson wrote, for outsiders. In addition to the Kwakwakiwak guests and leaders from up and down the coast were invited, although Mil w Wilson did press Mungo to allow some anthropologists to be, quote, classified as Indians to attend and witness the proceedings, including Cyril Belshaw. <laughs> uh, provincial officials and donors and media were invited on day two and the public on the third day. When the on the third day, the house was packed with 300 people inside and an estimated 1,500 turned away. On each day, Mungo Martin gave speeches of welcome and conclusion, which were interpreted by Dan Cranmer from Alert Bay. There were traditional songs and dances. And throughout the three days, Wilson acted as the usher at the door, directing guests to their seats, perhaps an appropriate role for the provincial anthropologist. Newspaper reactions to this, this event were interesting. There was a lot of attention, particularly in Victoria, um, and actually, to its credit, um, the uh, Victoria Times um, exhorted the non-native population to see this as an opportunity to welcome First Nations people into the community. In, in Vancouver, not so much. The News Herald was quite disparaging. It reported that Victoria had finally got some nightlife as Mungo Martin opened the new, jo new joint with everything on the house. It's a one way of describing a potlatch, I guess. <clears throat> Thunderbird House, the uh, Thunderbird Park, and the house named Wywood Hitler, and the potlatch to open it were all examples of involving First Nations people in the representation of their culture and engaging the wider community in that endeavor. And these, in these initiatives were also a partnership between two individuals, two cultures, and two institutions. On, at the end of the third day, Mungo bestowed on Wilson a name, Zidetlak, saying, I don't consider us to be two men, rather as one or related. The name belonged to Mungo Martin's father and was the last name bestowed at the ceremony. Though not in a First Nations community and in some respects innovative as well as traditional, 
The housewarming potlatch was the first to be held after the clause banning the potlatch was dropped from the Indian Act. The opening of that house was the high point in the carving program, although it did continue, and several other carvers worked with Mungo, Henry Hunt, Tony Hunt, and Douglas Cran Cranmer, and even Wilson's close friend Bill Reed came over to work on the project for a couple of weeks. Wilson did struggle to maintain the level of funding through the provincial government. Uh, <clears throat> and through the mid-1950s, the budget had to be supplemented by other means. In, 19, in August of 1962, Mungo Martin passed away, and Wilson heard the news while he was on a field trip in northern British Columbia. He rushed back to Victoria, and Mungo was laid out in the house that he had built at Thunderbird Park. And once again, as he had done at the potlatch in 1953, Wilson screened people at the door to turn away curious sightseers. Wilson arranged for Mungo Martin to receive an order, a Canada Council medal posthumously. He was, the only second person, he was only the second person in Canada to be given that award. And in his letter to the Canada Council, Wilson wrote that for him, Mungo Martin was, quote, was one of the truly great men I have had the privilege of knowing. So Wilson Duff and Mungo Martin were, in, true, in a true sense, I think, colleagues. So let me turn to the second piece of uh, Wilson's work uh, at the Provincial Museum. And that's the um, process of totem pole reclamation which he carried out in several parts of the coast, um, at an instance of Skungwai at the very southern tip of, uh, the Queen, of uh, Haida Gwaii, at uh, a place that w Wilson knew as Kitwan Kool, now Gitanyau, and also at a number of um, Haida villages in southern Alaska. I want to, fo I want to focus particularly on Skungwai. So standing in place and through time, grounded in the land and facing the water, totem poles were proclamations of social power and artistic imagination. They expressed the authority and prestige of the owner and the skill and creativity of the artist who carved it. By 1950, there was a long history of removing totem poles from the villages on the coast of British Columbia and taking them to museums in many parts of the world. There were few left in British Columbia, either in museums or in villages. Wilson began by visiting the deserted Haida villages of, uh, of uh, Haida Gwaii uh, in 1953 and 1954, places like Kumshua, Skadans, and Tanu, names that resonated for Wilson out of the past. And he was shocked at the desolation with, he said, bits of fine old carving you can see betraying the life and vitality of old. In the silence, he visualized the lives that people had lived and wanted to preserve something of the remnants that remained. In Skidigat, he spent time with the elders and he learned about another deserted villages then known as Ninstance or Skungwai. Skungwai was protected by its remoteness and was thought to have the largest number of totem poles still standing on Haida Gwaii, and Wilson became determined to save some of them. There would be opposition, not because it, then it was seen as a colonialist appropriation, but because they were not worth the trouble. Uh, so on the theme of Vancouver Sun headlines, here's a couple. Um, Harold Weir wrote several articles um, expressing outrage at the waste of time and money uh, uh, devoted to rescuing totem poles. And there were other naysayers. Harry Hawthorne, Wilson's mentor and now his colleague in this uh, enterprise, recently, had recently applied to the Canada Council for a grant to support totem pole restoration and was turned down by the Canada Council, quote, on the grounds that the unnatural or artificial perpetuation of a dying art does not make sense. Now Wilson understood that by taking totem poles from Indian villages, he was capturing the art, moving it to a different cultural context, and then playing a role in determining what were their significance and meaning. That's what museums do, or that's what museums did. 
<coughs> At the same time, for Wilson, any concern about appropriation was overwhelmed by his passion to save a few of the monumental sculptures in British Columbia before it was too late. Many anthropologists and some First Nations people, including Bill Reed, believed the art form was dying and those totem poles still standing would be the last. For them, therefore, it was an urgent matter to save a few examples of the art. And for Wilson, an instance, with its long row of totem poles still standing, but being steadily engulfed by the forest, silently beckoned. So Wilson gave talks and wrote articles for newspapers to gather public support for this enterprise. He was aware of the murky history in British Columbia of totem pole collecting. So he was determined to be scrupulous about consulting First Nations people before any poles were rem removed. It was very difficult to establish ownership of the poles at an instance or at Skungwai because the village had been deserted for a generation and it was not an Indian reserve. Wilson spoke many times to the elders and the band council members in Skidigat to establish where possible the, uh, where, where was the ownership of the poles. And he wrote this article in the Native Voice, which is the newspaper at the time that was directed to indigenous communities under that headline, Have We the Vision to Save Haida Totems? <clears throat> he emphasized that it was necessary to find the owners of poles and that ownership and sale needed to be approved by the band council and there should be payment for the sale. He indicated that he wanted to develop a program to save totem poles and invited support and suggestions for all who may be interested. In 1956, he made a trip with a museum party to Skangwai and carefully mapped the village. Skangwai is a lovely, fascinating little site. Um, and it's on this tiny inlet, which is actually uh, tidal, dry at low tide. Uh, it fa it's on the uh, western side of Anthony Island and it face we faces west, but in front of it, um, there's a little islet that really protects it from the elements. And uh, there you can see Wilson using his mapping and navigational skills. Uh, has mapped out the village and the, sites of, the site of all the houses in that, in that village. <clears throat> From what he could see, he imagined it as it was and was deeply moved by what he saw and imagined. And he, and he wrote as follows. In a way, it was a depressing scene. Here were the bleached bones of a proud way of life that was dead. <clears throat> Many of the carvings were decayed beyond recognition. The frames of the old houses had fallen askew and lay rotting on the ground. Moist vegetation had overrun the village, but it was also an awesome and stirring sight. There was, there was a strength and a strange beauty in the boldly carved figures of grizzlies, beavers, and whales staring out from the poles. This art had been developed on the rugged, tempestuous coast by a hardy and vigorous people attuned to its rhythms, and like all great art, it reflected the spirit of its time and its makers. At any rate, I was awed by the sight. He continued discussions with the Skidigat Band Council. He took along Peter Kelly. Peter Kelly was born in Skidigat and a prominent advocate through the 20th century of First Nations rights and claims. Um, but Peter Kelly's role was important because his, m his mother's second husband was a man called Tom Price, who was a prominent Hyder artist, and the last man to be given the name, ha to hold the name of Ninstance, Chief Ninstance, and to live in the village. But there were missteps in the process of organizing this, uh, this uh, rescue. The whole thing attracted a good deal of media attention and a Victorian newspaper conveyed the impression the museum party had already taken some of the polls and that set off a, uh, a response in Skidigat and the uh, band council passed a motion banning all removal of any polls and uh, having read that <clears throat> in a Victorian newspaper, a woman, a Haida woman from uh, Ketchikan, Molly Stewart, wrote in the agent in uh, Prince Rupert claiming ownership of some of the instance polls through her grandfather. Um, and objecting to their removal, though at the same time expressing a willingness to work with the provincial museum. 
Wilson wrote a reply, a polite and reassuring reply to Molly Stewart asking for her help and with, with any information she could give him about the Ninstance Poles and the ownership of them and the families that came from there. Wilson wrote also immediately to the band council to reassure him, them that there would be no poles removed without the permission of the band council and any confirmed owners that they could find. An instance had been abandoned for about 80 years by this stage, so it was really tough to find out uh, who were the genuine owners of the poles. But the band council, uh, he and the band council were working with Peter Kelly and now Molly Stewart to establish uh, who owned what uh, at the old village site. <clears throat> Wilson went back up to Skidigat in the, in the spring of 1957 to another band council meeting um, and convinced the council to pass a resolution indicating that they would work with the museum. Um, and he was not surprised to find that the instance poles were the subject of much discussion in the museum. It was still not clear who owned them. He worked with Peter Martin, the chief band councillor, to find a way through the issue, and they agreed on the urgency of, of, of saving some of the poles. The band council wanted all claimants uh, to have an opportunity to establish their rights, and they wanted the claims to apply to specific poles, not just general claims to the village. In the end, the band council decided to hold an open meeting where everyone could be heard, and then the band council would determine if they could the ownership, but in the meantime, a salvage operation would go ahead, um, and the, band, the payment would be through the band council, who, who would then distribute the, uh, the funds. Wilson was pleased with the band council's action, thinking, quote, it is proper that the decision on ownership be decided in the village without any pressure one way or the other from me and he proceeded to arrange a salvage operation that summer. <clears throat> At the 11th hour, Indian Affairs, as it was wont to do, threw a spanner in the works, raising an objection to all of this because they argued the Skittigat Band Council couldn't assume jurisdiction because it wasn't an Indian res instance. Skangwai was not an Indian reserve. Uh, the Indian Commissioner suggested that Wilson check with the Attorney General's office, but Wilson was prepared to get legal advice, but was not going to be governed by the outcome. He was convinced that the work through the council, the band council, was the way to go. Um, he had, the previous fall, had an instance made into a provincial park that would give it some measure of protection. Uh, but Wilson responded to Indian Affairs that while there may be a strict legal ob there not be a strict legal obligation to establish ownership of the Skungwai Poles, there is a more powerful imperative to recognize, moral imperative to recognize native rights and ownership of the Poles. The best body to judge the validity of various claims was the council. So with negotiations completed and matters resolved, Wilson turned his mind to a return visit to Skangwai and he gathered a crew of anthropologists and uh, hired a Sena boat High, uh, with a hider crew to take them there. <clears throat> they set up camp near the head of the little inlet that leads into the village site, um, but they didn't know the area very well. They were too close to the water and they got flooded out in the first uh, teeming rain that happened, as often happens in that part, of the, that part of the coast. And Wilson later referred to the experience as ruins in the rain. Wilson's reverence for the totem poles at, at Skungwai is clear from the, the pictures and the writing that he, that he does of them. His, uh, his uh, four individuals who um, were and became big names in uh, Northwest Coast anthropology looking up at the poles at uh, Skungwai. So there was reverence for the poles, but <clears throat> the process of removing them was not that pretty. With ropes and pulleys and block and tackle and crosscut saws, they cut the poles at the base and lowered them into beds of uh, spruce boughs where they were cut into sections and uh, they built frames around them so that they could be protected as they were transported out. And the poles were then rolled down the beach on pieces of driftwood ready to leave their home. They were pulled out through the channel at high tide 
behind a small boat and secured behind the Sena. They spent the night in the sheltered well waters of Loose Coon Inlet, just north of Anthony Island. And next morning, the Poles were transferred to a Canadian Navy vessel and taken to Victoria and Vancouver to be shared equally by the Provincial Museum and UBC, where they are still standing today. So here are some of the Skungai Poles at the um, Royal BC Museum uh, in the display outside the main door of the museum. I don't know what they're going to do with that display um, in the current changes. And here they are at uh, the Museum of Anthropology. Wilson was actually quite upset with the way they were shown in that museum. Um, he, like you can see with the middle, the middle piece of totem pole, he thought they were pinned to the concrete wall like botanical specimens rather than treated with the reverence that they should be as pieces of high art, high Canadian art. A few years later, Wilson refined the process of negotiation over salvage and res restoration of totem poles. There were a number of surviving poles in, as it was known then, Kitwan Cool, now Gitanyau, and also even more than in Skidigat, determined opposition to removing them. Several years of patient and respectful discussion led to a unique contract whereby four or five poles would be taken down to Victoria and replicas made and the replicas returned and erected in the community where they now stand. And as part of that agreement, the uh, Kitwan Kool people would tell their own stories, history and laws, and they would be published in a book to be used in university teaching. And the history, territories and laws of the Kitwan Kool um, is the outcome of that negotiation and that process. And Wilson was very proud of that, that book. Um, and he certainly did use it in university teaching. Peter Williams, the president of Kitwan Kool, two decades later recalled, recalled how Wilson had approached the people of Kitwan Kool to talk about their totem poles. His voice was soft and gentle, but firm with truth and honor. Wilson had earned respect because when he dealt with Indian histories and rights to the land, this is still uh, Peter Williams talking, he did it resolutely, profoundly, and with intensive care. Wilson was later involved, and I'm not going to go into the details of this, in another totem pole salvage uh, um, process in, su in the southern Alaska panhandle, in the Haida villages in southern Alaska. Um, and there he is uh, looking up at the remnants of one of those poles. The removal for restoration of the Ninstons and other poles was not controversial at the time, except for those who thought, like the Sun columnist, that it was a waste of time and money. In Skidigat, Roy Jones, the Sena skipper who took them to, from Skidigat to uh, Skungwai, uh, told me that he never heard a word of controversy about the removal of the poles back in Skidigat. And Wilson remained in very much involved with the Skidigat community. <clears throat> he was given a Haida name, Gwaigwanthalan, meaning his head is resting on an island. It's a name that had formerly belonged to the great Haida artist Al Albert Edward Edenshaw. Bill Reed also never regretted the removal of the Skungwai poles. But the removal of those poles today has become just another example of colonial appropriation. As looking back, people take no notice of the care and attention that Wilson devoted to that process. More recent writers have expressed the view that museum anthropologists such as Wilson Duff distracted attention from First Nations land claims by exhibiting artifacts and restoring totem poles, and they call it displacement by display. The argument is that by removing cultural items from the land, anthropologists were removing evidence of prior possession and therefore were complicit in the disp dispossession of indigenous peoples. For Wilson, the artifacts and the totem poles absolutely confirmed indigenous ownership of the land in British Columbia, and that prompted him to contribute to court cases that sought to establish that point in law and this is another story, 
uh, but he was a key expert witness both in White and Bob in Nanaimo and the Nushka case, which were the crucial um, groundbreaking cases on beginning to establish First Nations ownership of the land in this province. And in that process, Wilson had to con even convince the lawyer Tom Berger, who was the lawyer in both of those cases, um, <clears throat> that they were talking about indigenous ownership, not just use of the land. There's a certain amount of fiction that's been written about Wilson Duff, two, one novel and two operas actually. Um, and they all portray him as racked with guilt about removing the Skangwai poles um, in, 90, in 1957. It's not just fiction, it's unmitigated nonsense. Saving the poles and recognizing that they were great art is one of the few things that Wilson did not feel guilty about in his life. There were many things that he did. Um, <clears throat> and that um, legacy of trying to work closely with First Nations people to represent their cultures um, was often forgotten. The Museum of Anthropology was built at, U at UBC when Wilson was a faculty member there. But the first direct director of the museum uh, basically dismissed Wilson's expertise around the display of totem poles that Wilson had recovered at Haida Gwaii. <clears throat> and after Wilson passed away, the director of the museum often wrote about partnerships with First Nations groups and people to develop museum displays as if it was a bold new innovation. Some at the Royal BC Museum have since recognized Wilson's pioneering and collaborative work, but recent upheavals there are partly based, partly at least, on the narrative that First Nations voices are being heard for the first time. Wilson did many other things as provincial anthropologist um, without getting to the time that he was a faculty member at UBC. He had some conversations in the then museum with a young schoolboy called Roy Henry Vickers, which led to Roy becoming uh, a major First Nations artist. From the sublime to the ridiculous, he also turned down a request from the Alma Mater Society of Victoria College to hold a totem pole sitting contest in Thunderbird Park as that would show a complete lack of consideration and respect for First Nations people and their cultures. <clears throat> but the partnership with Mungo Martin at Thunderbird Park and the salvage and restoration of totem poles were particularly important to Wilson, as they have been to others. In 1969, Robert Davidson went back to Masset and um, had the project of carving and erecting a totem pole in the village. It was the first totem pole on Haida Gwaii in about 80 years. Um, the art certainly had languished, or whatever word you want to use. And Robert Davidson is very clear that he could not have carved that pole without having the old examples to look at in the museum. And in particular, what he learned from the, the old ones in the museum was the impact of weathering on a totem pole. A totem pole can stand for 80 or 100 years, but it's not the same at the end of that time as it is when it's put up, first, first put up. So that impact of weathering on a totem pole was particularly important to him. Just last year, Richard Hunt, a descendant of Mungo Martin, raised a new totem pole right in front of Wawid Itla. And in the course of the um, reports around the raising of that pole, Richard Hunt said that the 1953 opening of Wawid Itla, quote, is where our culture was reborn. Now, <clears throat> I, here's the academic uh, kicker in this. <laughs> <laughs> so bear with me. <clears throat> when history is defined through the lens of the present, at least two things happen, I believe. One is, people from the past are judged and found wanting by our current thinking. Salvaging totem poles then be thus becomes colonialist appropriation in retrospect. And then second, claims are made today that ideas and approaches are new when in fact they were developed by those who went before. So partnerships with previous partnerships with First Nations people 
uh, tend to be forgotten as reconciliation becomes brand new. People like Wilson Duff are found wanting by the first presumption and then are more subtly denigrated by the second. This is Skungwai today. Well, I took this photograph, it was probably four or five years ago. Um, but it's even more weathered now. And two or three year years ago, a storm ripped through the site and uprooted a number of the house beams and totem poles. So it is suffering still uh, the ravages of time and weather. Remnants of a few poles still stand, silent witnesses to a once vibrant community. But they will soon be gone, returning to the earth from whence they were born. Leaving Skangwai in June of 1957, Wilson reflected upon and wrote about his sadness of the world that was lost. Um, and I think Wilson is a lovely, careful writer. He republished these words that I'm going to read to you in an article that appeared shortly after his passing in 1976. And it's to, to me, it's as if he wanted us to hear it after he was gone. And he talks about Skungwai when he was there in 19, or writes about Skungwai when he was there in 1957. <clears throat> what was destroyed here was not just a few hundred, few hundred individual human lives. Human beings must die anyway. It was something even more complex and even more human. A vigorous functioning society, the product of just as long an evolution as our own well suited to its environment and vital enough to participate in human cultural achievements, not duplicated anywhere else. What was destroyed here was one more bright tile in the complicated and wonderful mosaic of man's achievement on earth. His writing's a little bit gender specific. The wonderful and the one more bright tile in the complicated and wonderful mosaic of man's achievement on earth. Mankind is the loser, we are the losers. I think it's a pity that so few were listening then and maybe even now. Thank you very much. <laughs>